Hi, fantasy fiction fans, and welcome to Myth and Magic, a fantasy writer's kit bag. I'm fantasy writer Neil Mack, the author of Moondog and the Reed Leopard, and I want to share my love of folklore, local history, and nature mythology with writers and creatives like you on my regular podcasts. It's designed with fellow indie publishers and writers in mind, but all fans of fantasy fiction are very welcome to join in. In my fantasy writer's kit bag, writers, artists and creatives will find lots of ideas and discussion about things such as potions, dark arts, fabulous creatures, folktale studies, nature lore and the interesting history behind the myth and magic that underpins our understanding of the fictional universe. Hello fantasy fiction fans and welcome to Myth and Magic episode 49 on September the 2nd and I apologise right at the very start because last week there was no show and this is the first week that I've missed the show for nearly a year and there's a reason for that and it's a good reason I attended my daughter's, my oldest daughter's wedding on Wednesday, which is the day the show goes out, and uh, her wedding was at uh, in Bristol, which is the uh, beautiful, quite famous and very interesting historical harbour city in the southwest of England. And of course, it's not just the day, is it, when you go to a wedding, especially your daughter's wedding, um, there's the preparation leading up to it and preparation on the actual day, and then sort of like the getting over it a bit so it did take really a whole week so although Wednesday was the actual date of the wedding last Wednesday which is the day that the show normally goes out on Wednesday um, there was a whole load of getting ready for it and then we had to travel down to Bristol it's not close by English standards it's over 110 miles away from here I had to travel down there had to uh, stay over for three nights and then come back and then we had all of the getting over it bit. In fact, I was asleep for nearly a whole day afterwards. But uh, it was a very nice day. It worked really out really well. And just a little bit of personal stuff there, but just to explain why there was no show last week. And this week, um, I'm pleased to announce, and it's a big announcement, that my new uh, non-fiction book is out, So You Want to Write Fantasy. Um, it came out on the 1st of September, so I was just finishing off doing the bits and pieces uh, which was required to launch that. And the idea of the new book is really sort of to give lots and lots and lots of tips. It's bumper packed with information. I have put in everything I can think of, which a new writer or a writer which is um, starting to think about writing in the fantasy genre, or somebody who has come back to the fantasy genre. But I've tried to pack in as many bits of information as I can. There's over a hundred chapters. It's a very long book and it's got a whole load of stuff which you won't have come across ever before in any book that you've read about writing the fantasy. Not only do I cover the things which um, I think should have been covered by other people before but they not necessarily have. Things like what is fantasy? What is fiction? How, do, how does fantasy begin? Where does it begin? And um, the differences between myths and fairy tales and fantasies and the different types of myths and the differences between sky fire and fantasy. But I've also covered things which you won't have come across before, but you would have if you've been listening to this podcast right from the start, but things about paracosms, how to choose a main character, working on your aesthesis, equipping your characters with kinetic potential. But I've also covered a whole load of other stuff which um, you possibly have come across, you have come across in various different books, but I'm putting them all together in one book. So this is not only a book that you can read through and it's a little bit light-hearted. I purposely make it a little bit light-hearted. But it's also one that you can keep on your in your Kindle and eventually when there's a paperback a copy, you'll be able to put it on your work desk because it's also going to be a dictionary you can go back to if you like so I've got in there definitions of a wizard definitions of a witch definitions of wicker definitions of you know 
monsters and dragons and kings and knights. But also I've put in there important information that you'll need if you're going to be serious about writing fantasy. So I've explained how to impart dread, how to create the unknown, how to bring about epic, how to look into paranormal and then to create your own paranormality, um, how to create your own psychic abilities for your characters. Um, and I've put a lot of, a lot of um, important information about um, things you possibly haven't come across before, like the Locus Amaneus that we discussed on the show before, um, and about Bardo and about um, scrying, how to scry and what is scrying. And all those sort of things. And I've put a whole list of action verbs in there, which is really useful. A whole list of omens and signs in there. Things that people, uh, you could use in your imagery or people might dream about or come across. And I've put in there uh, my syllabus errorum, which is um, a list of the mistakes I made that I wanted to share with you as well. And that's right at the end of the book. So my new book, the book's title is So You Want to Write Fantasy? with a question mark at the end. It's by Neil Mac, N-E-I-L-M-A-C-H. It's out now on Kindle, and it's out now at the special price because it's um, just been released at $2, or one ninety nine if you're paying in pounds. So pick that up if you can. If you want to have a free copy of that and you're a listener, that's fine. Just contact me on Twitter, at Neil Mac, N E. E-I-L-M-A-C-H you'll need to have an email so I can deliver it and um, you need to tell me what format you'd like that in and that's fine as well I'm happy to deliver that free to you if that's what you want it's also available on Booksprout if you're a Booksprout person so the new book this week the CNN news channel in America has been reporting that the matriarch of the Northwest apple industry, and it's known as the old apple tree of Vancouver, a tree which was planted in 1826 when the fur traders of the Hudson Bay Company first arrived and settled in that area. That tree has died. Now, some listeners will remember that I attended the Apple Tree Man ceremony, um, which is a traditional apple wassailing festival in a local cider orchard here in Surrey in England on the 12th night of this year, and um, I talked about that in episode 20, um, which was released on January the 23rd. Apple Tree Man is an English folk ceremony that asks for spiritual protection for the oldest apple tree in any orchard. And uh, Apple Tree Man is the word that you give, or the title you give, to that oldest tree. Now, I do hope that the good people of Vancouver have had the good sense to regularly go out and toast the health of their oldest apple tree. You do need to do this. But the apple tree man in the uh, English side orchard isn't just there on his own. He's the oldest tree in the orchard. In other words, he's like a shepherd to all the other trees. So you pay that old tree respect and he will look after all the other trees. Now, legend has it that um, this particular tree, the one that has unfortunately died, the old apple tree of Vancouver, comes from a seed that was given to the Royal Navy Lieutenant Amelia Simpson, who was given them at a dinner party in London just before he departed for the remote fur trading outpost in the Pacific Northwest. He was given it by a girl who said, take this with you and plant it and think of me. The tree was initially grown in the yard of a house where a bloke called John Johnson, who was a cooper, a person who made barrels, he lived. And Faye Peabody, who was the official pie baker of Oregon and Washington, she baked a pie using apples from that actual tree and she presented that pie to President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Franklin Delano Roosevelt. The old apple tree is not identical to any other named variety in the world. And we know that because um, they've checked um, the data sets of several thousand apple tree varieties. They've got them uh, profiled on DNA. And so therefore the old apple tree of Vancouver, this one which has unfortunately died, is genetically unique. In other words, it's one of a kind. There was only one of this apple 
on Earth, possibly in the whole universe. But fortunately for all of us, a descendant of the old apple tree was planted near the Clark County Historical Museum in the 1950s, and I think that's going strong. And also people have been encouraged over the years to take cuttings from the tree, so all around the United States of America, certainly up there on the um, northwest, there's probably descendants of the old apple tree growing in people's gardens. But I wanted to just go through some apples in tradition because uh, they are interesting. In tradition and in art, apples are often portrayed as mystical or forbidden fruit. But the difficulty here is that almost all fruits uh, that, that are not nuts or berries, by the way, were described by early people and by early civilizations as apple. And even, incidentally, the humble potato, it was known as an apple. And it's still known, by the way, in French as an earth apple. So that means that the forbidden fruit that's mentioned in the Garden of Eden story in the Holy Bible Book of Genesis cannot be accurately identified as an apple, even though artists throughout history have always portrayed it as an apple and it's talked about as an apple. Apple, the apple word, actually just means fruit. In fact, in the original Greek text, if you translate the Greek, it does say melon, M-E-L-O-N. But when you um, investigate a little bit deeper into the word melon uh, in the Greek, I'm not talking about the Hebrew here, but in the Greek, and when you um, investigate that a bit deeper, you find that even melon is a, f is a word for all fruit. It's one of those words which is a placeholder word. Also, interestingly, I'll just finish on this note, melon is very similar to malum, malum, M-A-L-U-M, which is another word that we use for peach or plum, which is exactly the same word in Greek for evil. So poor old apples, they get a bad name, they get a bad reputation. They're thought of as forbidden fruit. It might just be that apples are completely innocent and they weren't growing on that tree in the Garden of Eden and they do not contain evilness. Look after your apple tree if you've got one. Make sure you go out and toast it, especially every single year on the 12th night. is Albion, A-L-B-I-O-N. And you've probably heard this word used to describe Great Britain or England, but what is the origin of the word Albion? Well, Albion is an alternative name for the islands of Great Britain, and it probably comes from the ancient Greeks who first visited these lands and they first mapped out the coastline in fact, they actually wrote about the first people that they saw. And the first people they saw in Albion were the people down in Cornwall. But anyway, the word is likely to be associated with the river god Alpheus, A-L-P-H-E-U-S, of Greek mythology, who was a son of Oceanus. And he looks a bit like our image of the Old Father Thames. So if you've seen the picture of the Old Father Thames, you'll know that he has long flowing hair and a long beard that turns from bristle and into water rivulets. Albion is a word that imparts the colour white, or Alpheus is a word that imparts the colour white. So presumably the Greek mariners saw the famous White Cliffs of Dover and other waypoints on their journey around the islands and they noticed that all these were white because of the chalk outcrops and so it's possible that that's why they named these lands the white lands but also as a nod uh, to their old water deity Alpheus and in fact this god Alpheus and his whiteness that he's associated with is also invoked in other European toponyms such as the Alps and the country Albania. But anyway, going back to the idea about Albium and about it being an enigmatic name for Britain. It wasn't really considered to be a magical name or an enigmatic name for Britain until much later. And it was revived as this idea 
by the Romantic poets and especially by William Blake. And I like the idea, and I want you to think about this idea, especially if you're writing about the uh, fantasy or myth and magic in the British Isles. I like the idea that the Britain that we see, the Britain we experience, and the Britain we understand and know is Britannia, but the hidden one, the one which is in the different dimension, the one which is in the fantasy dimension, but is still here amongst us, but is unseen, is the Albion. And that's one of the ideas that the Romantic poets developed. But the Romans, of course, um, talking about Britannia, the Romans, of course, used the various forms of Britannia to understand and to write about these isles. Britannia, Britannus and Britannicus were all used to describe their most westerly province. And it's a fact, actually, that Pliny the Elder, which is one of the most important historians of the uh, Roman conquest period, he made the point. He said it was itself named Albion, while all the lands about which we shall soon briefly speak are called Britanniae. Very much later, in the 14th century, an elaborate origin tale was developed. And this claimed that there was a semi-god named Albina and her sisters, and they founded Albion to raise a race of giants. Now, according to this tale, which I'll say is 14th century, so it's a long time, long, long time after the Greeks and the Romans, it's modern. But according to this modern tale, some Greek women were stranded on the islands for various different reasons that I don't want to go into now. And in fact, these women were princesses. And these women gathered acorns and fruits. But once they learned to hunt and to eat meat, this food that they were, new food they were eating, the meaty food, um, aroused the lecherous desires in them. But as there were no humans on the land, they chose to mate with evil spirits that did reside there, called the incubi. You know about incubi and incubus and succubus. But anyway, um, through uh, mating with these incubi, they subsequently begot sons, and those sons turned out to be giants. And so this is how their uh, race of giants was raised. So when the princesses died, the uh, giants carried on. It's an elaborate story, and it's a good idea, because politically motivated story, I think, is trying to say that from these shores came a race of giants. But that's the uh, origin of Albion. A-L-B-I-O-N. What is a clouty well? Cluchtis, or sometimes clouties. Cluchtis is C-L-O-U-G-H-T-I-E-S. Or clouty wells, C-L-O-O-T-I-E wells, are wells or springs, usually with a tree growing beside them, that are places of pilgrimage in Celtic areas. And in Celtic Scottish, a clouty or a clout, C-L-O-O-T, is a strip of cloth or a rag that's been tied to a holy tree, and the holy tree is found by the holy well or spring. Now, these pieces of cloth, these clouties, are dipped in the holy water from the holy well, and then they're tied to a branch on the holy tree as a votive offering, whilst a prayer of supplication is said to either the spirit that dwells in the wellspring, or most often and most usually, in recent times, an associated Christian saint. There's normally a saint, often a travelling monk, who is associated with that holy well. And so the prayer is done in supplication to a spirit or to a saint. Though it's important to remember that these places are pre-Christian in origin. They're pre-Roman. So a local water goddess or a nature spirit has dwelt in this spring long before Christianity and long before the Roman conquest of Britain. The sacred trees at these cluty wells are often hawthorns or ash trees. Both these are considered to have some kind of magical properties and were probably valued by the Druids originally. 
Of course, having a fresh water spring is a very valuable thing anyway. It's an important source of uncontaminated water. And so it didn't just have magical healing properties. It had just common sense properties. If you wanted to collect fresh water, fresh uncontaminated water, you would have to go to the spring or the well. This very ancient tradition of Clutie Wells is where we get our notion very now of flicking a coin into a wishing well. Some people will um, flick it over their shoulder to make a wish come true. And weirdly, and I've noticed this and I'm sure you have as well, that it's something of, often something as banal as flicking a coin into a plastic pond in a you know shopping centre or something. Wherever there's a bit of water, people tend to throw a coin in and do a wish. People like to do these things, though in Celtic times, I must sort of underline the fact that devotions and invocations at a Clutie Well did have serious intentions. You were asking the saint or the spirit for good health, but often you were asking the saint or the spirit who lived in the well for a cure. The famous French town of Lourdes, which I visited, and where the visions of Mary took place was formerly and probably since prehistoric times by the way a place of pilgrimage for people so it was a place of pilgrimage before christianity that's the first thing to think about why did people go there they went there to visit the holy spring in fact there was a spring temple there a pagan temple that was dedicated to the gods of water and even today the lord's water is part of the important reason to pilgrimage there you pilgrimage there to obviously see the place that the visions took place in the grotto you also go there to obviously um, commune with the other christians from across the world and there are several thousand of them there every single day you go across there for the holiness and the sanctity but you also go there for the lord's water the lord's water flows from a spring in the grotto where the vision of mary took place and analysis of that water um, has proven it to be inert. And what I mean by that is it's not mineral water. It has absolutely no antioxidant qualities. It has no obvious health giving properties. It nevertheless has been claimed to have helped cure tens of thousands of pilgrims over the years. But St. Bernadette said that people were healed not by the water, but by their faith and their prayers. So if you go back to the idea of the clutie wells and the clutes, once you hang that strip of cloth up on your hawthorn tree, once it's been dipped in the water and you've said your prayer, that's the bit which will cure you or protect you rather than the drink of holy water. But that is what a clutie well is. Mm -hmm.